1876, America was recovering from a bitter civil war and celebrating its centennial by moving forward with the Industrial Revolution that began in Great Britain. America's contributions would change the world forever. At the centennial celebration in Philadelphia, buildings lit by gas lamps displayed mighty steam engines that would have formed the power and energy backbone of the emerging industry. It was gas and coal that were the main raw materials of energy that would burn to boil the water to make the steam. Electricity, discovered a century earlier, was still a novelty to most, with a few notable exceptions. Early in the 1800s, British inventor William Sturgeon invented the electromagnet. He explored the relationship between the flow of electrical current and magnetism. American inventors seized on this idea to develop the means of communication over wires at long distance, and the telegraph was born. An American inventor, Charles Brush, began working with the electromagnetic principle. By rotating a wire through a magnetic field, he was producing an electric current in the wire. Observant visitors to Centennial Hall may have witnessed a small generator called a dynamo connected to a steam engine lighting a single light bulb. The contributions of many inventors, most notably Nikola Tesla for his invention of alternating current, made the central distribution of electrical power possible. Perhaps the most notable power generation plant of that era was built at Niagara Falls, New York. Electrical generation was dependent on the steady means of keeping a wire moving through a magnetic field. True to its birth in the time of the steam engine, steam power became the main method of keeping electrical current flowing, and unfortunately, it remains so today. The power generation plant at Niagara Falls, however, broke the steam power mold early on. The steady flow of water falling from Lake Erie into Lake Ontario provided a non-polluting, free resource that kept the generators turning. Hydroelectric power was later joined by wind turbines as alternatives to steam. As the demand for electrical energy rapidly grew, steam became the most easily deployable method of producing it. Unfortunately, the raw materials used to create steam often come with serious pollution problems and are not renewable or free. Nearly a century and a half later, science and technology have provided so many new ways of producing energy that it's time we learn how not to boil water. Coming in at number three on our list of how not to boil water is perhaps an unlikely suspect, natural gas. Natural gas is a relatively clean burning fuel used widely from home heating and cooking to electrical power generation. If it were a plentiful resource, it should be the hands-down winner as the fuel to create steam. Unfortunately, natural gas is a finite, non-renewable resource that is becoming increasingly difficult to extract from the ground. Vice President Dick Cheney's former company Halliburton came up with a solution for mining natural gas that has been adopted by the industry. This solution is called hydraulic fracturing or fracking for short. Wherever hard to mine gas is found, a shaft is drilled into the ground and then filled with a secret soup of chemicals mixed with water that blasts the ground with fractures. After the liquid drains off or is removed, gas can seep out of the fractures up the well to be collected. Hydraulic fracturing is being used in over half the states in America. This is mostly due to regulations put in place during the Bush-Cheney administration exempting the oil and gas industry from the Safe Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Superfund laws, and dozens of other safety regulations. What's in this fracking fluid, you ask? Technically, it's a secret, a trade secret. What has been learned about this Macbeth-like witch's brew is alarming. Fracking fluid contains over 500 chemicals, some known to be cancer-causing. Protection of groundwater by recapturing and containment of the used fluid does not appear to be working. An eerie parallel, also involving Halliburton, is the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon accident in the Gulf of Mexico. BP chose to cover up the disaster by using a chemical soup called a dispersant to keep a majority of the leaking oil out of sight. The formula for this soup is also a trade secret. 
Unfortunately, some of the same cancer-causing chemicals found in fracking fluid were used in the dispersant formula. The Subcommittee on Energy and Minerals will now come to order. Both the industry and the government have repeatedly stated that hydraulic fracturing is safe and any groundwater that appears contaminated is actually safe to drink and use. As filmmaker Josh Fox found out, people from all over America were experiencing the sickening of their animals and family members exposed to water they were told was safe. An alarming number of well water supplied homes displayed a disturbing trend. You could light their tap water on fire. Okay. <laughs> Don't drink this water. With protections and exemptions in place for giant industries and less and less protections for the citizens of the planet, a very dangerous destruction of important ecosystems is underway. Hydraulic fracturing scars and pollutes the land enough to completely negate the benefits of natural gas as a clean, burning fuel. Number two on our list of how not to boil water should be no mystery to anyone. It's coal. Coal is used globally to provide energy and it has been known for years that burning coal introduces serious pollutants into our environment. American singer-songwriter John Prine wrote a song about the place of his childhood that became the anthem not for the chemical or heavy metal pollution associated with coal, but rather for the ugly destruction of beautiful landscapes caused by coal mining. Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County Down by the Green River where Paradise lay Well, I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late in asking Mr. Peabody's coal trains hold it away. The type of coal mine in northeastern United States, John Prine's Paradise, contains sulfurs and heavy metal pollutants, including mercury. It is a combination of coal mining and coal burning that has caused virtually all of the fish in the United States to contain enough mercury to be unhealthy for consumption by most humans. In 2008, over a billion gallons of coal ash sludge spilled from a coal plant dam into the Tennessee Valley. Accusations of lax or no regulations attempted to place blame, but the toxic devastation could not be debated. This soup contained poisons like arsenic and heavy metals like lead and quickly destroyed over 400 acres of fish, farms, and homes. Because coal contributes to about 30% of Earth's carbon emissions, it should be no surprise that it is a centerpiece of the ongoing climate change debate. America used over 900 million tons of coal in 2009, but China, literally fueling an industrial boon with cheap energy, burned over 3 billion tons of coal in that same year. Regardless of your opinion about climate change, our health and the health of our planet requires that we get a handle on our carbon emissions and related pollutants. The coal industry has an answer, clean coal. They call it carbon capture and sequestration, or CCS for short. In theory, CCS works by gasifying coal in a process that separates air to gasify the coal, and then further separates hydrogen for use as the plant's fuel, and carbon dioxide, which eventually gets injected deep into the earth. At least, that's the theory. Clean coal technology is something that can make America energy independent. This is America. We figured out how to put a man on the moon in 10 years. You can't tell me we can't figure out how to burn coal that we mine right here in the United States of America and make it work. You can't tell me we can't make it work. Well, it doesn't. Not yet. World leaders continue to meet to discuss things like carbon credits and taxes that would help motivate clean coal technology, but poor economic times and a lack of desire to regulate big business has clean coal on a back burner. The long-term health and environmental effects of burning coal should put it at the top of our list, but there is one fuel source that is far worse. The number one way to not boil water, drum roll please, Nuclear reaction.
redemption. The brilliant minds of the past century have unlocked the secrets of the power contained in the nucleus of the atom. As we all know, the violent release of this power has given us the most devastating weapons this planet has ever known. Science has not provided us, however, with a way to directly tap into nuclear power with a safe and direct conversion to usable energy like electricity. Instead, we have the best idea they could come up with. Control a nuclear reaction in a way that uses the heat created to, you guessed it, boil water. Because the raw materials used to create nuclear reactions and the nature of the release of this energy, radioactivity has become a common concern worldwide. $25 billion for 2008, $25 more billion dollars for 2009. Why should the American people be subsidizing something that hasn't worked for 50 years? Even Albert Einstein, father of the famous equation E equals MC squared, is quoted as saying nuclear power is one hell of a way to boil water. Everyone agrees on one thing. The main problem associated with nuclear power is what to do with the spent fuel. Spent fuel, which includes depleted uranium, is not spent or depleted with respect to radioactivity. No, that takes nature thousands to millions of years to make these radioactive materials safe. Governments have plans for burying nuclear waste deep underground, but this solution always finds opposition by anyone who doesn't like the idea of this stuff being buried in their neighborhood. The military-industrial complex has found a use for depleted uranium. As uranium is a very heavy metal, the U.S. military likes to tip its bombs and bullets with it to assist the ammunition in penetrating armor. Depleted uranium, or DU for short, is considered by many countries as a weapon of mass destruction because of the wake of radioactivity it leaves on the battlefield. Since its use in Afghanistan and Iraq, birth defect rates in these countries have skyrocketed. The nuclear industry would have you believe nuclear power is safe. The events at Three Mile Island woke up Americans for a little while, but it was the actual partial meltdown in Chernobyl that really pointed out the serious dangers of an accident. As serious as Chernobyl was, it pales in comparison to the incident unfolding in Fukushima, Japan. On March 11, 2011, Japan was hit by a massive 9.0 earthquake that was followed by a tsunami devastating much of the northern Japan area called Fukushima. Four nuclear reactors located in this area suffered severe damage and the world is now witnessing its first multiple reactor meltdown. Hydrogen explosions at a nuclear plant in Fukushima, North Japan, have sparked fresh concerns over safety. In the hours after a devastating earthquake and tsunami hit Japan Friday, United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon spoke out, voicing his solidarity with the country. The world is shocked and saddened by the images coming from uh, Japan uh, this morning. Brave workers trying to prevent four nuclear reactors at the Fukushima power plant from exploding have run into even more problems. The roof of reactor four is now cracked and reactor four is on fire. The levels at the plant are enough to kill a man within five hours. This is a dramatic escalation. As this film leaves the editing room for its final release, the situation in Japan is not resolved. Radiation from these multiple meltdowns continues to contaminate the air and water miles from the accident site. Milk products on America's west coast are testing positive for radioactivity. Radiation can now be measured all the way to America's east coast as well, and there's no end in sight. In the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster, countries like Germany and Switzerland have set a course for nuclear-free power policies. Science is attempting to provide safer nuclear reactor designs, but we must ask why. The generation of power no longer requires that we boil water at all. Spinning a coil of wire or magnets to make electricity is a method that will be with us for some time to come. Wind power can be harnessed to spin our generators, and scientists are working on ways to store and transmit electricity generated by these renewable resources. By now, everyone is familiar with solar panels, which are an array of solar cells. Solar cells are an amazing invention based on the photovoltaic principle, or PV for short. PV provides for the direct conversion of one type of energy, in this case, photons of light, 
to another usable energy, electricity. Fuel cells are another means of converting energy sources to electricity. Fuel cells are a cousin of the familiar battery. As long as the fuel keeps flowing through it, the cell will produce electricity. The most common fuel source is hydrogen and oxygen, and the main byproduct is water vapor. Many manufacturers of fuel cells design them to run on natural gas, which provides the necessary hydrogen. This use of natural gas is more efficient than using it to boil water. Fuel cell vehicles have been introduced and continue to be developed. However, there is still a problem of where to fill up the hydrogen tank. As promising as wind and solar are, there are other developments that stand ready to change the face of the Earth and our lives. Fans of a concept called overunity generation claim it is possible to build a combination motor generator that uses part of the power generated to run the motor that spins the generator. It is called overunity because any power created beyond that used by the motor is free to use or sell. Opponents of this idea call this perpetual motion and claims it violates the laws of thermodynamics. For decades, a project has been underway in Budapest that has resulted in the design of an overunity generator called Energy by Motion, or EBM for short. Once the EBM is brought up to speed, it completely spins itself with plenty of energy to spare. It does work, and it is being prepared for commercial use at this time. Perhaps the holy grail of energy creation involves the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen as a virtually unlimited source of non-polluting fuel. For years, there have been reports that people have found a way to make a motor run on water. And for years, there have been conspiracy theories about how these backyard inventors have been paid off or even murdered. One such inventor, Stanley Meyer, was actually granted U.S. and international patents for his efficient water splitter. Meyer pulsed the input energy at specific high frequencies, which immediately began creating more hydrogen fuel energy than was input. Meyer went on another step and redesigned a car with no fuel except a water tank. In spite of the fact that his invention worked, Stanley Meyer's ideas were rejected by the scientific elite because he did not have a college degree. The government claimed his invention was perpetual motion and accused him of defrauding his investors. Finally, surrounded in controversy, Stanley Meyer died of a mysterious illness classified as food poisoning. Meyer's ideas are not lost. Inventors are planning to release products that will provide personal power generation systems that run on water. Power is perhaps the largest and wealthiest industry on this planet. This power industry has a great deal of stake in the status quo. That is, they are and will be very difficult to move to make any change in how they conduct business. Regardless, our future and the future of the Earth depend on our stewardship of the planet and its resources. Remember one thing. It's not their planet. It's yours. Captain, I've run this ship aground since no one's laughing. Will you pass that bottle around? I'm gonna write a note. Gonna let my message flow to As a United Nations messenger of peace and as a fellow human being, I want to reach out to you, the people of Japan, from the other side of the world. As a United Nations and UNESCO ambassador, and as a citizen of Jordan and the world, I would like to express to you our admiration for your courage and dignity during this tragedy. As a United Nations messenger of peace and as a fellow human being, I want to reach out to you, the people of Japan, to let you know that you're not alone. You're in my thoughts and the thoughts of people everywhere as you rebuild your lives after the tragic events of March 11th.